So far, we've talked about the brain as having four distinct regions. And we've talked about each region as having distinct functions. But actually, there are also networks of neurons from different regions of the brain that work together for common purposes. And these are called functional brain systems. So these neurons span wide areas of the brain. Um, they really can't be uh, held down to one area. And the two functional brain systems we know about are called the limbic system and the reticular formation. So let's start by taking a look at the limbic system. The limbic system is, no, uh, is located on the medial part of each cerebral hemisphere. And it includes structures such as the rhinencephalon, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and part of the thalamus. People think of the limbic system as the emotions part of your brain because it allows you to experience feelings. For example, the amygdala, allows you to recognize angry or fearful facial expressions on somebody else. It also elicits the fear response in you. So let's think about what the feeling of fear entails. When people are really frightened, they tend to have an elevated heart rate. They also can be breathing very quickly. Their blood pressure might be elevated. You might have goosebumps, which remember are caused by the erector pili muscle contracting and causing the hair to stand up. Some people appear very pale as the blood is redirected to muscles and sometimes there is sweating. So these things are the physical sensations that come along with the feeling of fear. And of course, there are also um, the mental aspects of that. Another part of the limbic system is called the rhinencephalon. And the rhinencephalon triggers emotional reactions in response to odors. So for example, you might have had a favorite aunt who died several years ago and she used a particular perfume. And then one day you're in the department store and you smell that perfume and it makes you feel sad. So that's an example of an emotional reaction in response to an odor. That's the job of the rhinencephalon. Uh, and lastly, we have the hypothalamus. Now you might remember that the hypothalamus is actually a part of the diencephalon. So remember the four regions of the brain are the cerebral hemispheres, the diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. So the hypothalamus is part of the diencephalon, but here it is also part of the limbic system. In fact, all limbic system output is sent through the hypothalamus. So think of the hypothalamus kind of as a neural clearinghouse where all outgoing action potentials are sent. And those include both autonomic or visceral nerves and also limbic or emotional responses. Now the limbic system also reaches up to the prefrontal cortex and prefrontal lobes. So therefore, when people are uh, reacting emotionally, you can also be thinking consciously of what's happening. The other thing that this can can affect is that when people are emotionally upset, for example, it can interfere with cognition or thinking. And that's why they say, tell people when you're feeling really upset, wait, don't make an important decision at that time. And so these are how these things are connected. Um, there's a lot of research out there on the impact of stress on your brain, and it's a very real phenomenon. So um, this is a short little video that I recommend you watch. And as you watch it, I'd like you to answer a couple of questions. So question number one, how does cortisol affect the brain? You will see that cortisol is a hormone released when people are stressed. How does that affect the brain? 
Um, the second question here is, can a sensitivity to stress be passed down to offspring? So some people are very sensitive to the effects of stress, oops, which means they don't handle it very well. Can the sensitivity to stress be passed down to offspring? And lastly, you're going to look at the effects of cortisol on the brain. Is it possible to reverse the effects of cortisol on the brain? Okay, so these are the questions I'd like you to think about as you watch this video. So again, here's the, the limbic system. You can see it. It's in this area right here, you'll see the hypothalamus, which is part of the limbic system. The hippocampus, I did not mention that, but that is also part of it. And you can see the amygdala in this region. Now, another uh, part of a functional brain system is called the reticular formation. And you can see in the picture that everything in purple here is part of the reticular formation. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, a lot of the reticular formation is found within the brain stem, but then you can see it projects out um, to the cerebral cortex. So the reticular formation is involved in several things, including motor control of visceral organs, so control of organs such as your digestive tract, um, breathing, respiratory centers. It also has a very interesting structure within it called the reticular activating system or RAS. And it says here it plays a role in awake, sleep cycles, and consciousness. But I'd like to draw your attention to consciousness. The RAS actually screens out 99% of all incoming information. So 99% of all incoming, which is, of course, sensory information. So if you think about that, that's an awful lot of information. Um, so everything you experience every day, which includes temperature, sound, taste, heat, things like that, um, pressure on your body, 99% of that never gets to your cortex, and so you're never aware of it. And that actually is kind of important. What the RAS is doing is it's screening out what it considers to be old news and only letting in new news. If all the sensations that your body is exposed to were constantly being recognized, it would be very difficult to focus and pay attention. So this is actually an important role of the RAS. The other thing you, we might look at is what inhibits the RAS? Okay, so what inhibits the RAS? Well, remember that the RAS has to do with consciousness. So what are some things that can inhibit that? Well, alcohol, enough alcohol will do that. Sleeping pills will inhibit the RAS. Tranquilizers. Uh, but also certain drugs. So for example, LSD inhibits the RAS. And it does that by causing neurons that are supposed to be screening out information by preventing them from doing that. So in other words, in the case of LSD, too much sensory information comes in into the body. Okay, so at this point, you probably have gotten the idea that the central nervous system is very delicate. Remember, the brain has a consistency of cold oatmeal so it needs to be protected, and there are five things that protect it. The first is the skin, and next is the skull, or if we're talking about the spinal cord, the vertebral column. Next under that, you have the meninges protecting the brain and spinal cord. Next, cerebral spinal fluid, and last, the blood-brain barrier. So let's look at each of these 
Very quickly, we'll start with the meninges. So the purpose of the meninges is to cover and protect the central nervous system. And you remember when you did the sheep brain dissection, you could see the meninges covering the brain. Also, cerebral spinal fluid runs through the meninges. In, in uh, particular, it runs underneath the arachnoid mater. And the meninges always also form these partitions within the brain. So let's start with the dura mater, which is the external covering. So it is the outermost, or I should say most superficial covering of the brain. Dura mater, mater means mother in Latin, and dura means tough. So this literally translates to tough mother. Um, if you did the sheep brain dissection, we'll remember that the dura mater is very tough. It's a fibrous connective tissue. You can see through it. It's almost like wax paper, and it has two layers. One layer, the periosteal layer, is attached to the skull. The other layer of the dura mater, which is called the meningeal layer, is attached to the surface of the brain. So the dura mater tends to be have two layers, and it folds inward in several places. One place that it folds inward and separates the brain is called the fox cerebri. So this is not spelled the way it sounds, fox cerebri. And this part of the dura mater dips into the longitudinal fissure which remember is a deep crack which runs from the most anterior part of the brain to the most posterior part. So this is called the Fox cerebri. There is another dipping of the dura mater along the vermis of the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum actually has two mini hemispheres, just like the brain. And this huge fissure between them is called the vermis. So where the dura mater dips in here, it's called the fox cerebelli. And then lastly, um, <laughs> there is another area right here. So if this is the cerebellum, and above the cerebellum is the cerebral hemispheres, um, this is another place called the transverse fissure. So it's another fissure. And the dura mater comes up and tucks in here. And in doing so, it kind of forms a tent over the cerebellum. So they call this the tentorium cerebelli. So let's take a look at a real brain to see what this looks like. This is a human brain on the left side. You can see they've removed all of the meninges. And so you can see the surface of the brain with the, the, the gyri and the sulci. And you can see that there are actually blood vessels running through <clears throat> the sulci. On the right side of the brain, you can see the dura mater here. It looks kind of like wax paper. And you can see that it dips inward right here at the longitudinal fissure. Oops. Okay, that's the longitudinal fissure. So right in here. <laughs> if, you, if we look down here, we can see the two spheres of the cerebellum. And we can see that there's another fissure heel here, which is called the transverse fissure, right here. So it says transverse sinus, but it's also a fissure. And you can see that the dura mater folds inward here. That would be the tentorium cerebelli right here. And then there's one more place the dura mater will come in and fold in, which is right here. That is the vermis. Remember, the vermis is a fissure between the two um, lobes of the cerebellum. And where that tucks in there, they call that the fox cerebelli. So, Again, here at the top, we have the fox cerebri right there, tucking in here. And then <clears throat> tucking in right about here, we have the tentorium cerebelli. And then when the dura mater comes over and tucks in here, we have the fox cerebelli. 